Hello, hello. And welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a show that we do bi-weekly in which we talk about anything that we feel like on the subject of the Beatles. Their group years, their solo years, their history, individual songs, albums, anything we feel like. Uh, we can discuss right here in our show. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my syndicated Beatles radio program on over 40 stations right now called Every Little Thing. Also another uh, talk show podcast on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts on the show. First of all, a man who's been a fixture. I do like to use that word. In New York radio. (laughs) It's like a lighting fixture, right? (laughs) like a lighting fixture hanging from the ceiling. Okay. Yes, yeah, or a painting on the wall. Illuminating um, everything around you. Yeah, that's oh, it. very very nice, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's been in New York radio now for 37 years, correct? There, I think it's actually more like 36, but who's counting after? I mean, nobody's counting except me, really. Okay, well, I've given you a promotion. Thank it's 37 you. years in New York radio on... WFUV, where he has done excellent programs and many great interviews on the station. And that's our very own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hey, everyone. How you doing? Also, we have the author of a couple of books on the Beatles. There's From the Cavern to the Rooftop and also Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything and for many years worked at the New York Times as their classical music writer. Also writes for Beatle Fan and other publications as a freelancer, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're kind of going to do uh, something like a This Is Your Life, Alan Cozen program. (laughs) And the reason why I thought of doing this is because in the past, from time to time, Alan will talk about certain people in the Beatle world that he's had a chance to meet and possibly interview. And we spend a little bit of time on that, and then we really want to dive a little bit deeper into the conversation about that. So I thought we would spend this show talking about some of the people that Alan has met and interviewed. (laughs) It's a very impressive list, and I doubt we'll get to all of them, but uh, the spotlight will be on Alan for the show today. So the pressure's all on you. Okay. You know. (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm going to go get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> we can watch the Met game while Alan talks. Okay? Food, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. food that you can throw. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, as usual, we got the latest in Beatle news. Number one item, according to the Nielsen Music Mid-Year Report, the Beatles and the Korean pop band BTS are the only two acts to sell one million album units so far in 2020. Half a century after their breakup, the Beatles are the biggest rock band of 2020, selling almost 1.1 million album equivalent units. They had the fifth best-selling vinyl album with Abbey Road, selling 54,000 copies, and the Beatles also performed extremely well on streaming services, with many songs racking up hundreds of millions of plays. That's as impressive as you can get. You know, for a band that broke up 50 years ago. Simply amazing. 51. Also, 51. 51. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Physically or publicly. <laughs> and now who's, who's this other band? Bachman Turner? <laughs> <laughs> BTS, the okay. Korean pop band. I, oh, oh, sorry. You haven't gone to the BTS fests? Uh, no <laughs> BTS fests for me, although I went to... Uh, I took my um, I took my my wife, daughter, and and mother to see Barbara Streisand at Madison Square Garden last year in the fall, uh, actually in November, because at the time I was still kind of I still am hobbling, on a bum knee, but uh, I kind of went in the handicapped entrance and was waiting for a wheelchair to take me up to my seat, and uh, in the um, the theater at Madison Square Garden under the main garden there was one of those K-pop bands playing. There was a concert, and I've never heard screaming like I heard coming through the walls while I was downstairs in the bowels of Madison Square Garden. Actually, <laughs> I have heard that screaming when I'm in the de- when I'm in the dentist chair, but this was young girls screaming. It was it was completely very Beatlesque actually. Hmm. 
Oh, good. You know, there'll always be room for boy bands, you know, <laughs> in every single decade. It always happens. So, uh, yeah, but uh, it, it's so amazing to think that the Beatles selling that well, you know, 50 plus years on. Also, on July 17th, we saw the premiere of the remastered video for Beautiful Night, along with the release of the EP for that song, which recreates the original 1997 maxi single with a 1995 demo for the song. Also, an alternate run through recording and Ubu Jubu Part 5 uh, as a track there, um, a medley of Beautiful Night themed chat alternate mixes and interview recordings of Paul and Ringo speaking about the song. And of course, the big box set for Flaming Pie officially comes out this Friday. And speaking of Flaming Pie, Paul's website has been making a few recordings available for download, including the 1986, the early version of Beautiful Night, which is part of the Ubu Jubu Part 5 bonus track, only the version that's on Paul's website is in its entirety. It's not that way on the Ubu Jubu track. And also, uh, Paul has made available the song Some Days without the orchestration on his website. And that also is not part of the box set. And Rolling Stone just posted an article online reviewing Flaming Pie and offering an instrumental version of the song Broomstick, which Paul recorded with Steve Miller. And the version with vocals will be on the box set, but not this instrumental version that was offered in Rolling Stone. Okay? Yeah. Already it's confusing. <laughs> uh, let's see. More news here. We talked on our last show about Ringo's one-hour birthday special that was broadcast on his birthday July 7th on his YouTube channel, and that performance videos that couldn't make it onto the show are also online. We mentioned Peter Frampton's cover of It Don't Come Easy. Colin Hay has a video of him doing the classic photograph, real nice version, great harmonies on it. And Richard Marks has an acoustic guitar cover of a song that he co-wrote with Ringo, Speed of Sound, which is really a great song. So you can look for them on YouTube. Okay, uh, next Monday night, August 3rd, Access TV will have a music special called At Home and Social with Nuno Betancourt and Friends. Betancourt first gained attention as the lead guitarist in the band Extreme, and he'll be joined by an impressive roster of friends and artists, including Julian Lennon, who, together with Nuno, will perform Radiohead song, Karma Police. That should be interesting. Uh, other artists on this special include Nancy Wilson from Heart, Steve Vai, and also a surprise appearance from Brian May. There was a set list from the Beatles that turned up online dated January 17th of 1963. The list includes 19 songs planned with three of them left empty as if they hadn't decided yet which songs to fill. Interesting about this list is that George has many lead vocals and Paul has just a few. Uh, one interesting song mention is Hey Good Lookin', which is sung by George. And this was for their performance at the Majestic Ballroom in Birkenhead. Have either of you seen this list? No. Nope. No. Nope. I okay. have not. I saw it posted on Facebook and just looking at it, you know, in one of the Beatles' handwriting. I think it was Paul's. So it's interesting. Anytime you see a song title that you're not familiar that the Beatles actually performed, especially if you go through Mark Lewison's Beatles live book. But Hey, Good Looking was one of those mentioned in there. Mm -hmm. And with uh, special thanks to one of our listeners, Tom Brennan, we learned that on July 15th, Michael Lanning, a former member of the Dark Horse Records band Jiva, performed an acoustic guitar five-song music set on his Facebook page. Three of the songs came from Jiva's Dark Horse album. The songs were Something's Going On Inside, L.A., also, Hey Brother and Love is a Treasure. Okay? A major photography exhibit of Linda McCartney's work will be running at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. This will be from August 8th to September 1st. It includes more than 200 iconic images from the music scene of the 60s to family life with Paul. There will also be a selection of images taken in Liverpool and on the world that have never been seen before. So obviously they're going to be taking some kind of precautions there at the gallery 
there's got to be some form of social distancing there. So probably a limited number of people, I would think. But uh, this will be running from August 8th to September the 1st. Along with that comes the news, as reported in the Liverpool Echo, that the Cavern Pub and Festival Restaurant plans to reopen this Saturday after a 19-week shutdown due to the coronavirus. The news was confirmed by Cavern City Tours, who will also be reopening the Cavern's online shop again. Okay, now, while this is not new news, it is news that you might not be aware of, of something that happened this year. There is a band from Italy called Pinguini Tattici Nucleari, which translated means tactical nuclear penguins. <laughs> and they released a song this year, and it was called Ringo Starr, which they performed at the San Remo Festival. This obviously was before the pandemic hit. And this song called Ringo Starr proved to be extremely popular in Italy, enough to become a number three hit over there. All the words are sung in Italian, except for the name Ringo Starr. And you can check out the song on YouTube, and there is an official video for the song as well. I mentioned this on my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, and one of my viewers for that show was kind enough to find out the translation of all the words in Italian so we know what, what's being sung in there. So check it out if you can. Ringo Starr, the name of the song, Pinguini Tatici Nucleari. Okay? <laughs> Learn Italian at the same time. I Thanks. think, uh, wasn't that, wasn't that uh, Vito Corleone's olive oil company <laughs> in uh, The Godfather? Anyway. Uh, uh, let's see. We got more news here. Thanks to the wonderful Facebook page, Beatles in Print, Together and Solo. A new book is coming out called It's All Too Much, David Stark's Musical Adventures. The author attended the Yellow Submarine premiere was at the Rock and Roll Circus, and was an employee of Beatles music publisher Dick James. So I'm sure there are stories to tell for the Beatle fan in this book. No release date for that of yet. Another casualty resulting from COVID-19 is the British music magazine Q, who will be shutting down their doors after mm. being in business for 34 years. They celebrated the breadth of the pop music spectrum, and their next issue for July 28th will be their last. This leads some to question whether or not this means the end of the old music press and the closure of music magazines. Such a sad thing right there. Yeah, that's a pity. Good magazine. Anytime I go to a Borders or a Barnes & Noble, I always check out the magazine section and all the music magazines, and very often I'll pick up Q or... Enemy or one of those magazines if it has something that interests me and it's really yeah, I sad have I have boxes of uncut and, and yeah. classic rock and prog and, and Q and all of those right so uh, yeah. yeah where do you where do you find a borders by the way Ken um I think we had one here in Milford no I'm just usually a, a wide back. they went out of business a long time ago okay well then it's just Barnes and Noble <laughs> <laughs> just being just ha. being uh just making a funny okay okay well i'm not up to date on borders i'm sorry folks uh there's a brand new cover version of the wing song arrow through me by singer emoni wilkins which you can uh check out on youtube and we close our news with unfortunately uh the news of three major passings that we have to bring up the first is Regis Philbin, who, of course, was a mainstay on American television for decades with his talk shows with Kathy Lee Gifford and Kelly Ripa. And Regis dated all the way back to his years on The Joey Bishop Show, where he was a sidekick. Regis had Ringo on his show with Kathy Lee on July uh, 3rd, 1998, to promote what was then his latest album, Vertical Man. And Regis reminded him that he interviewed Ringo back in 1964 for one of the shows that Regis was involved in for Westinghouse. Ringo didn't seem to remember that. But uh, he did tweet, God bless Regis, peace and love to all his family. Regis died last Friday, one month shy of turning 89. Regis Philbin and Darren DeVivo have one thing in common. Regis is from my neighborhood in the Bronx. 
from the Morris Park area, and there is um, uh, a portion of Kruger Avenue that ha was renamed many years ago Regis Philbin Avenue. Uh, so if there are any Bronx sites or people familiar to the Bronx, you know, it's it's kind of like right near White Plains Road and not far from Morris Park Avenue and off Bronxdale Avenue. And there are street signs, Regis Philbin Avenue. So uh, he was a Bronx boy through and through. Very nice. Very nice. I guess you never met him or anybody no, in no, his family. Never. But uh, proud Bronxite, Regis mm. Philbin. Okay. Then there's the passing of Peter Green, oh, yeah. co-founder of the legendary Fleetwood Mac, a great guitar player known for the band's early hits, Oh Well, Black Magic Woman, which uh, Peter wrote and, of course, was a big hit for Santana. And there was a song that was a big influence on the Beatles, that being Albatross. This was an instrumental which came out in November of 1968 and actually went all the way to number one on the UK charts. And George Harrison once said that the Beatles borrowed the uh, dreamy, ethereal sounds of that record, and they used it for their song, Sun King. And I know that uh, on my show, Every Little Thing, uh, a few times I played those two songs back to back, and you can definitely hear the similarity mm -hmm. in the sound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, a huge, huge Peter Green fan still. Well, I say it like I'm not anymore. Uh, I am a huge, huge Peter Green fan and was very sad to hear of his passing and did a little mini tribute on WFUV Monday night. I did play Albatross. Mm. I can't believe, actually, I'm, I'm forgetting now, several days later. Yeah, no, I played Albatross. You, you mentioned, Ken, that that was a number one in the United Kingdom for Fleetwood Mac. All the hits that Fleetwood Mac has had in their 50 plus years, that was the only number one in the UK for Fleetwood Mac, which is pretty That's amazing. When you consider the success of the, the yeah. mid-70s, Fleetwood sure. Mac and Rumors albums, yeah. <laughs> right. That's that's surprising. It, it is really is. Surprising. They technically have had more success with their singles in the U.S. Mm. Uh, than they have in the U.K., and Albatross was their only number one. Wow. Interesting. There is also just a, a bit of a connection with George Harrison and Fleetwood Mac, which is that Jenny Boyd, Patty's sister, was married to Mick Fleetwood. So for a time, George Harrison was Mick Fleetwood's brother-in-law, just like There's Joe actually, Walsh is Ringo's brother-in-law. So, Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt one more time because it just occurred to me there was talk. I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, but there uh, I've read in several places that Apple wanted to sign Fleetwood Mac. I've heard uh, that. And, and, and the connection with George and Mick Fleetwood was one of the threads, but I guess Apple wasn't. I mean, they got a better deal. It was when Fleetwood Mac signed with Reprise Records. Uh, there was a moment where Apple could have maybe signed them, but, uh, you know, not to be. Mm. Yeah, that's something I really want to explore. You know, and, I, and we did talk with Peter Asher, I think, about this on the show, about certain artists that were rumored that uh, possibly they were going to be signed to Apple. You know, and in Norman Smith's book, he mentioned artists like Queen and David Bowie and Crosby, what? Stills and Nash. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if with Young or not, but um, no, yeah, no, but, no, not with Young. The first album, they were rejected, which is Crosby, Stills and Nash were turned down by Apple, which I find interesting for various reasons. <laughs> you know, and, and also considering that you know, I'm sure to some degree they were friends with someone yeah. like Graham Nash. Sure, they were. You know, and on their demo they had a really nice version of Blackbird. Mm. So they tried. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that didn't uh, secure the deal there. No. Mm. And if I could turn this podcast into a TMZ uh, uh, show, uh, <laughs> uh, Mick Fleetwood was married to Jenny Boyd. And in 19, what year would this have been? Around, I think, 1972-ish, uh, there was a guy in Fleetwood Mac, uh, he was a guitarist, I believe, Bob Weston, was a member of Fleetwood Mac for a brief period of time. This was when Bob Welch was fairly new in the band. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Danny Kerwin had, had left. Bob Weston might have been one of the replacements 
for Danny Kerwin. Anyway, Bob Weston wasn't in Fleetwood Mac very long because he ended up having an affair with Jenny Boyd and Mick Fleetwood got wind of it. And that was the end of Bob Weston's stay in Fleetwood Mac. Mm, okay. A lot of changes in that group. <laughs> A lot years. of stairs in that group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so Peter Green, uh, unfortunately, he passed away on Saturday, and that was at the age of 73. And then finally, there is Emmett Rhodes. And Emmett is someone that um, I only learned about when I first started doing my Beatles program in New Jersey on WDHA, because when I first started there in 1983, around that time, I was developing thematic hours on my show, and I wanted to do something along the lines of Beatlesque music, artists who were influenced by the Beatles that my listeners felt showed a very apparent influence that had some kind of Beatles sound. And I solicited tapes from my listeners to send me stuff, you know, apart from what uh, would be the more obvious artists like the Raspberries and Badfinger and ELO and Squeeze and those artists. And... Emmett Rhodes turned up in a lot of those cassette tapes, and that led to my going and searching out his albums, which at the time were out of print. And I would go to used record stores and buy them, and I really grew to love his music, which was, well, the solo albums that he put out on ABC Dunhill from 1970 through 73. There were three of them. What was said about him, especially with the first album in 1970, was how much his music was very much McCartney-esque. And there are certain songs where it just screams at you that um, it sounds like a Paul McCartney song. Like, um, She's Such a Beauty. If you get a chance, you can always check his music out on YouTube for anyone that doesn't know his music or somebody made for me from that first album. Um, and actually, to be fair, his career didn't start with the solo records. He was in a few bands in the mid to late 60s, one of which was called the Merry-Go-Round. And um, this is when he moved from Illinois to California. He moved to Hawthorne and um, he had a few minor hits with the Merry-Go-Round, a song called Live, which some people might be familiar with because the Bangles also covered that song. And um, and they got some some attention across the country with a couple of small hits like that one. And um, in the late 60s, he was contracted with A&M through, through the merry-go-round, and he made a solo album. It was a contractual thing called An American Dream. That really technically, I guess you can call that his first solo album, but most people tend to think of the first album on ABC as being his first solo. And um, so really, you had a merry-go-round album, you had An American Dream, and you had three albums on ABC Dunhill. And then in 2016, he released an album, his first in 43 years, called Rainbow Ends, and uh, a few singles in 2010. But the thing about Emmett Rhodes is that, you know, apart from sounding like McCartney, when he put out that album on ABC, which was in December of 1970, he not only sounded like Paul and his songs in terms of melody and arrangement and his voice, it was all McCartney-esque. He played all the musical instruments, too. And that was something that was entirely new, except for Paul McCartney, who did the same thing that year. So from what I've been told, there were a lot of comparisons made. He got a lot of attention on the radio. His album went as high as 29, which was kind of impressive for a debut album. And um, after those three albums on ABC Dunhill, he just vanished and was out of sight. And nobody knew what ever happened to him. And part of the fascination in Emmett Rhodes is the mystery behind what happened to him. And uh, we didn't really hear anything until 2016 with that album called Rainbow Ends. Darren, you said that you really were unfamiliar with, with Emmett? Yeah, he actually is one musician that has completely somehow uh, just fallen through the cracks for me. And while you're talking about him, I'm doing a little looking around here. So I think tonight I'm going to do some, some ex exploring his, his stuff and try to catch up on what I missed. Mm. Yeah. Alan, do you have any uh, thoughts about Emmett Rhodes? Um, Were you I think a fan of his music? Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty lovely stuff. Um, I remember it 
when the first album came out, particularly because of, you know, the fact that here was another guy who played all the instruments. Andy was a little McCartney-esque, well, a lot McCartney-esque. And, uh, you know, but he, he seemed a, a pretty solid songwriter. And like you say, he disappeared and, you know, came back. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, not for long, because I, I think when he came back, I mean, a lot of people did remember him. And, you know, we're sort of, you know, pleased to, to hear from him again. But, yeah, that's a pity. It's a, he, his, his stuff is, was pretty nice, and uh, I'm going to go back and, and re-listen to some of it, too, when I have a minute. Yeah, yeah. It's, he's one of those people who is, is like, uh, you know, sort of a tragic figure in the music industry because, you know, and you could say this about many others, you know, he should have been a lot bigger than he was. And I don't know what the reasons were, why he wasn't. And I questioned this on my other podcast show, whether it was a lack of promotion. And also I know from years of history, anyone that's ever compared to the Beatles or one of the Beatles, it's like the kiss of death. Hmm. And I don't know if that hurt his career at all. I don't think he, intentionally tried to sound like Paul. I just think that, you know, a lot of his music just did. And yet he still had a style that was his own anyway. He wasn't a Paul McCartney wannabe. You know, his, his songs stand on their own. But um, definitely a very big talent. And uh, unfortunately, he had a, a record deal with ABC Dunhill where he was contracted to put out six albums in three years, which is really... But very difficult it was very difficult for him because he did everything himself. He wrote the songs, he played all the instruments, he produced his own music, he built his own studio, which was in the uh, the garage behind his parents' home, and he did all the work himself. He did all the work himself, and so for him to come up with six albums in three years was really too much. And the record company sued him, and um, you know that obviously had a very tremendous effect on him. I know he said that he was very burnt out after those few years. And so, unfortunately, we never heard from him for a long, long time. He did have uh, some work that, that he found working at Electra Records as a producer. And um, he also rented out a studio to make a living. But uh, very sad that he passed away in his sleep and he was 70 years old, Emmett Rhodes. If you do get a chance to anyone who has never heard his music, Fortunately, we have this thing called YouTube, and uh, you can pretty much look up any song that he released. And like I said, altogether, it was six albums in total, three singles he released in 2010, which got withdrawn from the market shortly after that. There's even some unreleased music of Emmett Rhodes that you can check out on YouTube as well. But uh, I'm sure that many of you will enjoy his music, and you'll, you'll think it's quite a find especially listen to that album from 1970, just called Emmett Rhodes. Really fantastic song for song from start to finish. Uh, very sad news to hear about that. Okay, so uh, with that, why don't we... Oh, wait a second. One thing we have to mention here is about the Virtual Fest for Beatle fans, which uh, takes place August 7th through the 9th. And if you go to the Fest's Facebook page... You can sign up so that you can see the performances there and panel discussions. And we are going to try to be on a panel uh, teaming up, at least we're going to try to, with uh, the two co-hosts of Two Legs podcast. And that'll be sometime during that weekend. But just like we had a virtual fest for the one in New York back in March, they're going to do it again that weekend. A lot of great guests will be there, performers like Donovan is scheduled to be there. Mary Wilson of the Supremes. That's got to be a first time, I think, for the fest. And uh, Lawrence Juber, Steve Holly, a whole bunch of great people. Peter Asher, Billy J. Kramer. If you can, go to the Facebook page for the Fest for Beatle fans and uh, find out all the information for that. All right. So, Alan Cozen. Yes. The camera. <laughs> the spotlight is all on you. <laughs> well, the microphone, anyway. <laughs> oh, that's true. Maybe eventually we'll, we'll make this a video podcast. But uh, you have met many important people in uh, the Beatles universe, including two of the Beatles themselves, Paul and Ringo. Of all the people that you've interviewed, including Paul and Ringo, who would you consider to be the most interesting 
and why? You know, they're all interesting in their own way. I mean, George Martin's a pretty interesting guy. Um, but, mm. you know, Paul, um, you know, I think I had, I, I've interviewed Paul maybe three or four times. And um, one of them, partly because it was the longest, it was about an hour, um, you know, he, he then uh, cut down his interview times a bit. But we had, I thought, a really good talk that was partly because I was determined not to give him any opportunity to tell me that he dreamed yesterday or the gambling lambs or any of the standard McCartney stories. So he had to sort of dig a little deeper and come up with other kinds of answers. And I thought that that was really interesting. I mean, I wanted to hear Paul say stuff in this interview that I wasn't used to hearing him saying all the time. Um, mm. And, you know, when we talked about a lot of stuff, this one was in 1990. It was um, when Tripping Alive Fantastic came out. And um, one of the things that I asked him was, you know, for instance, why, why when you put out a single now, there are like, you know, four different B-sides on, you know, four different singles, and some of them are available only in Japan. And, you know, it, it would be a single from the album and to collect them all so that you can get all the B-sides, it actually costs you significantly more than the album, especially if they're Japanese imports. When the Beatles had a policy about not releasing singles from the album because they wanted to give people value for money, it, it seemed sort of um, as if he had abdicated that kind of thing. And he said his, inter his, his answer, I thought, was really interesting, not something he normally says. He said, you know, you have to understand, I'm not the Beatles. That was the Beatles. We had that policy. If uh, someone from the record company came to us and said something and we didn't like it, we would just say, you know, a rude epithet. Um, and, and they would go away. But, you know, now I have to listen very carefully. If a record guy comes to me and he has a proposal, I have to give it consideration, you know. And now everybody is putting out all of these B-sides that are, you know, scattered around the world. And, you know, I'm not the only one. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. No one ever asked some stuff like that. And um, uh, a few months earlier when I had... I was doing a, a piece about the Russian album um, because I had a friend who was a conductor who was going to Russia and called and said, um, hey, anything I can pick up for you um, when I'm over there? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, there's this <laughs> album. And this guy also was a big Beatles freak. I mean, he was a classical conductor, but, you know, that was also what he was into. And so he brought back like a case of them. And um, hmm. did, and did quite well, um, so uh, you know I, I was talking to Richard Ogden, who was Paul's manager at the time, and I asked Ogden that same question, and Ogden at that point said, "Well, you know, you sound a little more like a fan than a New York Times reporter, so let's see what the Times wants to do," and I said, "Um, excuse me." Or, are you suggesting that New York Times reporters are not supposed to be familiar enough with their field to know who's putting out B-sides in which countries, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think they think that. Uh, let's see, you know, for interest, I mean, George Martin was always great. He was not always the most reliable source of information because he remembers things the way he remembers them. And unlike someone like me, he doesn't spend all of his time pouring through paperwork and old recordings and all that stuff trying to, you know, study what it was. You know, he lived it. So he then moves on to the next thing and the details get a little fuzzy. I mean, as we know, I mean, he... he always used to say that uh, the reason he had Andy White come in is because he didn't know Ringo was coming. And the chronology is wrong. He had already heard Ringo. He didn't like Ringo. He doesn't like to say that, and I totally understand that. But um, Andy White then came to the next session. And at one point when he put out one of his Genesis books where he had a ghostwriter named Oliver Krask, and suddenly... 
the chronology was absolutely correct. And I went to interview him again and I said, I, I see that you now have the chronology correct about Pete Best, Ringo and Andy White. And he said, yes, well, you know, I, I didn't know Ringo was coming. And I thought, ah, Oliver Krask. <laughs> this is Oliver <laughs> Krask has fixes for him. And I called up Oliver Krask and, and said, you know, I mean, you're writing a story, you're supposed to get to the bottom of stuff. Um, I called up Oliver Krask and said, so what about this? You know, I talked to him and he still doesn't seem to think of it in terms of the actual chronology. Um, so I'm assuming that you fix that. Is that correct? And he, he was being very diplomatic. He said, well, you know, my papers are in storage and I can't really look it up right now. But um, so I, I really don't remember. But, you know. Um, the first time I interviewed him was when the first four CDs came out. And mm. when the first four CDs came out, you may remember they were in mono. And EMI was claiming this is what it was historically. They didn't come out in stereo back then. And having been alive back then, I knew that was a lie. Not just wrong. <laughs> that was a lie. <laughs> you know. So they, uh. they put... George Martin on and I, I said, look, you know, I understand that you prefer the mono ones. He's been saying that since only 1976, you know, which was six years after the Beatles broke up. This is the first thing, first time he spoke against the stereo mixes. So I understand why you prefer the mono, but why not have them both? You know, on a CD, you can fit both the mono and stereo mixes. And, you know, a as a collector, I was assuming they would all come out in stereo and we'd be all lamenting that the mono wasn't out, but now we're lamenting that the stereo is not out. So what is it? And he right off the bat kind of exploded EMI's entire myth about why they were in mono. And he said, well, you know, they came to me with the first four done and they were in stereo. And they said, haven't we done a great job? He said, you know, um, I, I listened to them. I, I, I didn't like those stereo mixes. I didn't think they should be in stereo. I certainly didn't mix them in stereo, which is not actually true. But I said, if you're going to do them in stereo, they must be remixed. And they said, well, can you do them in mono quickly? And he said, yeah. Uh, and they said, well, you have to do the first four in mono. He, he thought only the first two should be in mono. With Hard Day's Night and Onward, he had four tracks, so he could make a new stereo mix very easily and put the vocals centered or however he wanted them. But EMI said to him, no, we don't have time for that because our entire CD reissue program for the Beatles is based on the fact that Sgt. Pepper can come out on June 1st and it will actually be the 20th anniversary, so our ad campaign is, it was 20 years ago today. That was why the first four CDs were in mono. Um, so I had a good time yeah. writing that up because it became, it became you know, Beetlegate. <laughs> but they still, they still had to switch from the stereo mixes that they made to the mono in time. Yeah, but um, in other words, he, what he was saying is you can take the mono mixes and just transfer the mono mixes, and that's fine. But if you're going to do them in stereo, you must remix. Right. He didn't want to okay. just put out their stereo mixes because, you know, the stereo mixes of the first two albums are essentially the two-track masters. You know, the, there's hardly any blending that went on, which is probably why he says that he didn't mix them because they're barely mixed. Although on the paperwork he's listed as the producer on the days the mixes were made. But what I had also found while I was writing this piece, I had found, um, I had some old Beatles program books, you know, tour books, um, and I had some old British ones. And one of them was from late 63. And with the Beatles had not yet been released, but was about to be. So they had, they had it in the ad and they had a picture of with the Beatles and it was the stereo cover and they gave both the mono and stereo catalog numbers and they had a picture of please please me with the mono and stereo catalog numbers. So this sort of proves that they came out originally in stereo and mono. 
So, um, but you know, he didn't hold that against me. We had several interviews after that and we always got along pretty well. I mean, he's, here's the thing about George Martin, you know, he's a very, you know, you might complain about what he remembers or doesn't remember, but he's a very nice, polished, erudite man. He, he knows what he's doing. Uh, the, the second time I interviewed him, I think wasn't about the Beatles at all. It was about, uh, his setting of Under Milkwood. He did uh, he did the music and produced the recording and Mary Hopkins on it, a whole bunch of other people. Mm. So we talked about that. And, and in, in a certain way, it was refreshing not to be talking about the Beatles with him, you know, because this is about his own music. Um, right. And then we talked about one of his books at another interview, the, the one that Oliver Krask edited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could I just backtrack about Paul? Uh, yeah. Do you think that he appreciated the fact that these were not typical questions from a casual fan or, I don't, or just a regular journalist? Or does he feel more intimidated with someone that knows his stuff around uh, him? I don't think he feels intimidated ever. <laughs> Here's the thing about Paul McCartney. I mean, if keep in mind that apart from the Beatles world people I've interviewed, I've interviewed hundreds of of people in the classical music world and some jazz and you know all around and so I know how people behave in interviews Paul is the most professional interviewee I have ever seen you walk into the room and he immediately makes you feel even though as a journalist you know that this is not true he immediately makes you feel like you are old pals and he has nothing he wants to do more than answer your questions and that he's absolutely interested in what you have to say and what your questions are um that is a skill you know I, it really is, and he is spectacular at it. I don't know whether he found them challenging or not. What happened after, about a year later, I got a call from um, Mary Alice Williams, who used to be a TV interviewer on CBS, and she was going to go to one of his tour stops and interview him. And she said, you know, can you give me any pointers? And I said, well, you know what I would do if I were you? I would try and get as many of his print interviews and audio interviews as you have time to listen to, because he has certain set pieces that he does about, you know, dreaming, having dreamt yesterday and all that. I mean, that's just the most Mm. famous one, but he has a lot of them. And what you want to do is read all these interviews and don't ask him something that is going to lead to one of the standard answers and you'll get a really good interview if you ask him new questions so that he can't go into those. So what Mary Alice Williams did is she went to Paul and said, so I talked to Alan Cozen at the Times and this is what he said. And I said, wait a minute, you you said it to him like (laughs) by name, you mentioned me by name and you said that I said that about him. (laughs) And she said, oh yeah. And he gave me a great interview and I said, yeah, well, Thanks a lot. I think you owe me the raw interview tape, you know, pre-edited um, for this, and but she wouldn't send it. <laughs> so, hmm. There's this weird nexus between being a collector and a professional. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was that. It, but, you know, we, we spoke other times. I think the last time we spoke really was when Memory Almost Full came out. And, uh, you know, he also, rem- he has... And this is another thing about him. If he has met you once and, you know, I don't know whether you have to have done an interview with him or not, but he has an incredible memory for faces. Maybe a year or two after we did that first interview, he did a press conference at Well Recital Hall to talk about bringing the oratorio here. And I had gone to Liverpool and reviewed the premiere of the oratorio. And it had gotten on the front page of the national edition of the Times, but there was something going on with the subway, so it got pushed off the New York edition front page, sadly. And when you have a front page piece, usually it's just for your first front page piece, but I considered this my first, um, you know, Beatles front page piece, and that counted. You can get a plating of the front page, which is a, you know, a thin metal sheet of the plate that the page is printed from. Um, so since I was in Liverpool and not there to pick it up myself, I really made a pain in the butt of myself to my editors 
saying, please, please get me a plating. I got to have a plating. So when I got back, I ended up with two. So I go to this press conference and Paul apparently saw me sitting in the middle of the press conference and asked Carnegie Hall's people to bring me back to see him before this sort of open reception started. And I thought, well, that's weird. I mean, he saw me once like a year or two ago. I mean, how can he recognize me? He's Paul McCartney. He, he hangs out with famous people, you know? Mm. Um, so he brought me back, uh, or the, the Carnegie brought me back. Um, and I talked to him and Linda and he said, listen, you know, I was apparently one of, one of the relatively few to give the oratorio positive review. And he said, look, I, I, I just want to thank you for giving it a chance. And also, you know, Linda's father, who was a big New York Times reader, read it to me over the phone when it came out. And he was very pleased that, you know, the Times was taking my classical piece seriously. And I said, you know, and I told him, then, you know, about the platings in, in his quickly as I could. And I said, and I have two of them, so I can give you my other one if you want. And he said, yeah, oh. that'd be great. And then, you know, a crowd starts gathering around him and talking to him. So I naturally just sort of slink off, you know, cause like, okay, my, my few minutes are over. I'll get out of here and he can talk to all these people. He came around the crowd and said, Hey, how are we going to arrange that? <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll call your guy, you know, tomorrow. So I called his publicist the next day and they, arrayed, they told me where Paul was staying and when to bring it up. And I brought it up and, you know, we just chatted a little and, uh, and I gave it to him. So that was that. Yeah. Did you interview him then or is this? No, no, because, uh, you know, it, I had already covered the oratoria, which is what he was in town promoting. And, um, mm. And we didn't have an interview set up. I didn't have particularly a, an assignment for it, having already written about it. So it was just a, a pleasant little chat, you know. And it, it, it was nice. I mean, I mean, him coming around the crowd was really kind of, a, in a way, a special moment because it meant he actually did want that thing, you know. So, uh, yeah. So he yeah. now has a rare uh, two-of-a-kind uh, plating of a front page of the national edition of the New York Times, which has the review of his oratorio on the, I think, bottom right. So, wow. And we, yeah. But one question that I was going to ask you, Alan, in general, you uh, you know, all these high profile people, and if we were talking in general about other entertainers, I'm sure the list would grow uh, tenfold of the other people that you've interviewed. What is your psyche? What is your where, what kind of headspace are you when leading into these interviews? Nervous, confident, whatever the case might be. Uh, for somebody who's done many interviews, myself, as has Ken, you know, uh, I can't help but even after all these years still be a little uptight leading into them. And if it's somebody who's a major name, you know, yeah. I wouldn't say panicky, but rather, you know, stiff, at least at the beginning. How about you? Yeah, I would say somewhere in between nervous and confident. I mean, confident in the sense that I've done a lot of interviews. I know how to do an interview. I had my list of questions. I knew what I wanted to do. But also, for God's sake, these are the, Be you know, it's one of the Beatles, you know, Ringo, Paul, even Yoko. All of them are the probably the only interviews or there may have been a few others, uh, maybe Andre Segovia that I ever dressed up in a suit and tie to do the interview with. And, and, and with the Beatles, it's totally strange because, you know, one of the things I got from the Beatles is you can dress however you want. It doesn't matter. You don't have to wear a tie. You don't have to wear a jacket. But I just felt that for them, I should. Also, uh, Paul and Ringo are, I believe, the only people I've ever interviewed where I've asked for an autograph. Uh, I've always felt like, you know, it's not the most professional thing to do to ask for an autograph. And so all of these like classical heroes of mine, you know, including Segovia and, uh, you know, Leonard Bernstein, quite a few others, lots of great conductors, singers, players. I've never asked for an autograph because 
it's just not done. But I'm not going to be in a room with Paul or Ringo and not ask for an autograph. And with Ringo, I brought Old Wave because um, so few people had it, <laughs> the LP. Right. Um, and it turned out that when I interviewed him, um, sitting on the couch with him was Joe Walsh, who produced Old Wave. So I said, why don't you both sign this, you know? Ringo first, when I said, can I, can I get you to sign something? And he said, well, if you got a bootleg. And I said, no. <laughs> the, other, the other funny thing he said that day is one of my questions for Ringo was, you know, when you did Ringo Starr's Yellow Submarine, is it syndicated 26 week long show where he played Beatles records and told stories. One of the things you said was that, here's the song that we opened our famous Shea Stadium concert with, and then played I'm Down. Which, of oh. course, not only did they close it with it, but it was written to be a set closer. You know, it, it, it basically fulfilled the function of Long Tall Sally. Pretty much is Long Tall Sally in a way. And I said, why? You know, you were in the band. Why did you say that? And he said, well, because they gave me someone like you, a little mad Beatle professor. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that is it. My epitaph, little mad Beatles professor, <laughs> Ringo Starr. <laughs> so That's great. Yeah, that was you fun. You know what likely what likely happened was I'll bet you that he read all the scripts in a day or just a few days. Yeah. And he didn't even know the songs that they were leading into. He just read whatever was on the the script. Oh yeah, it's possible. I'll bet you. you yeah. Know. Yeah, oh, sure. You know. But I thought I'd ask, you know, just because I'm a wise ass, even if it's a beetle, <laughs> um, you know, but we with Ringo as well, you know, Ringo isn't quite like Paul. He's not quite the make you feel comfortable interviewee that Paul is. Um, but, you know, he has a sense of humor. I mean, the first few interviews I did with him. Um, and all the in-person ones anyway, I've talked to him on the phone too. Um, what I would do is I would bring him a tape of unreleased Beatles stuff. In one case, it was because um, I listened to an interview that he did with a friend of mine a few days earlier in Washington. Uh, and my friend sent me the recording and he said, yeah, I've, I've never heard if you've got trouble. Well, obviously heard it because he was on it, but, um, mm. but so I made him a tape that had "If You Got Trouble" and a whole bunch of other stuff, and I and I said, I heard you you say that you never heard this. Um, here it is, and you know I would bring a tape every time. And uh, one time I turned up, and um, he said, "So you brought me a tape," and I said, "Well, <laughs> no, I I, I kind of was thinking maybe this time you'd bring me one." And he said, "Yeah, right." <laughs> <laughs> But it was also it was also because of that tape thing. I mean, once they put me in a room that had a tape player set up and I was in there before Ringo was, I was waiting for him to come in. So I had with me the Cavern rehearsal tape. Um, and at that point, nobody knew what the date of that was. And consequently, whether it was Pete or Ringo, because we knew it was late 62 sometime, but we didn't know when. So I, I put it in, ready to play, and after the interview, I said, I've got a question that has to do with what's on this tape, and it's a rehearsal from the Cavern Club. And he said, well, we didn't tape much in the Cavern Club. Was it us? And I said, yeah, it's you. And he said, is it me? And I said, that is the question. And I played him, I just turned it on, and he listened for a while. Well, first he said, you know, if it's cool, it's me, and if it's just... It's Pete. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I put it on and he listened for, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds. And he said, that's me. So I felt, OK, now I've now I've been able to make a contribution to Beatles scholarship here. <laughs> At least we know it's Ringo mm. now. And that was the same day that I had brought in the tracking sheet for Four Nights in Moscow. And I, I mentioned it a few weeks ago on the show here where, uh, you know, I said, what about this track, Four Nights in Moscow? And he said, oh, you read it in someone's book. And I said, no, here, look. <laughs> uh, but he didn't remember it at all. But it, it clearly was early 1970, that track. But, you know, I mean... So, so when you interviewed Ringo, was it basically Beatle questions or were you there to 
to interview him for his latest album. Like you said, um, he had Old Way with him and Joe Walsh there. Uh, well, I yeah, I had Old Way with me, but this was 1989. Uh, this was oh, when okay. he was he was about to start touring again. Generally speaking, with Paul and Ringo, I have mostly tried to ask them questions about what they're there to talk about. And once I've gotten through enough of that where I have what I need about what they're there to talk about, and they can feel that I have not just beetled them to death, but have asked them about what they're there to talk about, then I'll throw in some Beatles questions, you know, mm. and that will, I'll do that until basically I get thrown out, <laughs> which, you know, in, in Ringo's case once, you know, I was asking a few of those and about, you know, what was going to come out and whether, for instance, the Shea Stadium concert will come out on video while we can still dance, you know, um, huh. and, Eventually, he just said, "Okay, you've had enough." <laughs> so that was, you know, you can't complain. You know, I got what I came for, and everything else was bonus. So, um, but you know, I've, I've tried to talk to them about what I know that they're there to talk about, and um, you know, if I can ask some other questions, you know, I will. I mean, one of the interviews I did with Paul was about the Beatles anthology, so obviously that was all Beatles. Mm. So, yeah, you know. What exactly do you remember him talking about with the anthology with you? It's funny. I just transferred it to digital a few months ago, and I remember listening and thinking, this is actually pretty interesting stuff, but I can't remember anything right at the moment that, that we got into. Um, you know, at the time, I hadn't seen anthology. I was about to go to England to do other interviews, and also they were going to show it to me when I was there. So, you know, what to ask was really more like, well, you know, you had the long and winding road. What was, you know, is this an outgrowth of that or how did it, you know, come out? And, uh, you know, and he would talk about things they used to do in the studio and things that, you know, because also I knew there'd be outtakes in the audio uh, things. So we talked about stuff like that. I mean, he said that he liked collecting bootlegs. Oh. Um, he said that he bootlegs other people's concerts, by which I think he just means that he records them. He mentioned going to Stevie Wonder, and he said I bootlegged him, but I, I don't think I don't think he meant bootleg in the way we would mean bootleg. You know, there wasn't Paul's yeah. recording in the shops the next night, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you know, he 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 said, you know, uh, here's the thing about bootlegs. I'm the guy who. If you take a picture of me at a wedding and you show me the picture and say, this is a great picture, I really like this picture, I, I might look at it and say, yeah, my nose is a little too big. And it's like that with outtakes, you know? It's really interesting to you, but to me, it's unfinished work, you know? Um, obviously, his attitude changed. <laughs> um, sure. But, um, but that was what he said at the time. So, you know, he could understand people collecting them. He personally didn't go after people who collected them, but that's because he had a lawyer who did. You know, he said, yeah, someone came up to me and said, your lawyer, you know, you always said you didn't mind bootlegs, but your lawyer uh, sent me this letter. And Paul said, well, you got caught, you know. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. But, um, and then, you know, the whole, the whole trip to England to talk about the anthology was kind of interesting too, because, um, First of all, I, you know, I got there and I went to their offices, which are in a place called Ovington Crescent. It's not far from Harrods. And um, so I went, in, went to their office and checked in and they sent me into Derek's office. Um, I had met Derek before. I'd interviewed Derek before. But Derek was going to be basically my minder for this trip. You know, he would be setting up all the interviews. He wouldn't necessarily be sitting in on them, but he would be telling me, OK, you've got this at two o'clock over here. You've got this at three o'clock over here, you know, and plus I interviewed him, went out to lunch with him um, and he arranged for me to interview Neil, which is was a really difficult thing to get because Neil Aspinall did not like to talk to the press. He just didn't. He was good at it when he did, but he mm. didn't do it much. And I had years earlier sent him a letter, you know, on Times letterhead and all that saying, listen, you know, 
a lot of people are surprised that Apple still exists. And I think it would be really great to have a story about what Apple is now and what Apple does, you know, for the Beatles, for its back catalog, which I'm not sure had even been reissued for the first time yet. But, you know, let's talk about Apple. I, I can do it by phone. I can come over to England, whatever. And he called me back and said, look, I really don't like doing interviews and I'm not going to do it. But I just felt I should call you and tell you that. And the next time I talked to him was, you know, every September until the anthology came out. Every September when it was slow time for news stories, there would always be a story saying new Beatles tracks have been discovered in a dusty old archive and they include Leave My Kitten Alone and Besame Mucho and you know, all the usual ones that we all had already on bootlegs. And, and so I figured, all right, you know, may, you never know when they're about to be released. Is this EMI just putting it out to stir up some interest or, or or is it just someone who's got nothing to do and decided to write a story? So I called Neil and he actually got on the phone, which surprised me. And I said, so what's the deal? And he said, you know what it is. It's the usual stuff. It's the same things that you, you already have on Bootleg. <laughs> and it's just someone writing a story. We're not putting anything out. EMI is not putting anything out. You know, that's what it is. So finally, you know, I'm in London in Apple's office with Derek and he brings Neil in and we talked for about an hour and it was great. You know, I could ask him about Long and Winding Road because he was the one who edited the original film. And, you know, he told me all about what went into getting the rights for the footage the anthology used. And um, in most cases, actually, they, their preference was to buy the footage outright so that they didn't have to keep going back and getting rights. You know, it was theirs. And, uh, and, you know, and Apple amassed a huge library of stuff while making the anthology. Uh, and they were helped to a great degree by the bootleg world. I mean, I went into Derek's office and sat down and looked up and the first thing I saw was a, the whole wall behind Derek was full of bootleg Beatles VHS tapes and beta tapes. I don't think DVDs were around mm. then, <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, you know, he had everything, you know, and they were probably using a lot of that as reference. Okay. This is, this is a, a, a TV appearance they made in 1965. It looks like crap, but we now know what it is. Let's go to the TV station and get the real one, you know, right. the kind of power that we all wish we had. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was fun. And, and then, you know, while I, I was there, I interviewed Chips Chipperfield and he interviewed Bob Smeaton and, um, and George Martin again and Jeff Emmerich. Jeff Emmerich was a little okay. disappointing because he mostly didn't remember anything, but I, I transferred that tape recently too. And listening to it, I wasn't really sure whether he actually didn't remember anything or whether he was just too afraid to say without EMI giving him permission for each answer, you know, what to say. Yeah. Because, you know, mm. it was like, well, did, you know, did they say I could talk about that? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm here for. So that, that interview didn't turn was, out to be much, but. Was that when his book came out? Oh, it was way, way before. It was in 1995 oh. when the anthology was coming out and his book came out in 2006. Okay. Um, when he had a ghostwriter to remember it for him, partly by interviewing other EMI engineers, several of he, whom, after his book came out, wrote to the publisher complaining that his ghostwriter had interviewed them and suddenly their stories were in the book and Jeff wasn't even there when this happened or that happened. So. So, yeah, that's why a part of me leans towards he just didn't remember. <laughs> and part of me leans towards he was didn't know whether he could say. And I, yeah, because yeah. I interviewed Jeff Emmerich when his book was out and he was with his, uh, the guy who co wrote the book with him, uh, whose last name I believe was, um, was it Massey? Was it Howard Massey? Howard, Howard Massey, yeah. And it seemed as though the interview was almost 50% with Jeff and 50 with 
Howard Massey. Although I was directing, of course, all the questions to Jeff Emmerich. It still was a good interview. Yeah. Um, but um, it, it, I didn't realize that. Uh, and I don't mean this to sound negative, but I didn't realize that Jeff would need to have his hand held so much yeah. uh, during the course of it. Well, here's a, a thing I discovered. Um, I discovered it in that George Martin interview when asking about the Ringo story. A lot of people who have a book ghostwritten by someone else actually never get around to reading it. I mean, if George Martin had read his book, he would have known that the chronology that he usually gives is completely different in this one, you know? Right. You know, Darren, it's funny because I interviewed Jeff Emmerich too at the time when his book came out and it was in a room where it was just him and me. Hmm. So Howard was not there oh, at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, no, I, it was, uh, Howard was there and it was, it was good. At least if my memory serves correct. But the thing with me in my interviews, regardless of who I'm interviewing, whether or not is a little bit of a blackout involved in it, maybe because I'm so intent at the time, I tend to not remember as time passes exactly how things went, unless there was something unique that jumps out at me, you know, that I will remember. Uh, another question actually then leads me that I wanted to ask you very quickly, Alan, and you don't have to mention names if you don't want to, but have you interviewed anyone that going in, you were a fan and you were looking forward to the conversation Meeting the individual, your opinion changed so maybe drastically afterwards because the interview was difficult or the person individual was difficult to talk to or wasn't very nice. I, I'm sure you ran into some of those. Um, well, no one in the Beatle world, which is basically what we're right. talking about. Um, you know, outside, yeah, occasionally people could be not what you hope they'll be. But in the Beatle world, you know, all the people that I talked to were you know, really interesting, fascinating, and, and, and generally speaking, pleasant to be with, you know, I mean, they're, right. they're, they're there to do this, and they understand, you know, what the deal is. So, you know, unless they have something against you in advance, which I guess none of them did, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be fine. Yeah, the only one in the Beatle world that I found that I was disappointed with was the first time I interviewed Julian Lennon. Hmm. which was when Photograph Smile was out. And I later got, just put two and two together as time went by, and then I interviewed him a second time. And it was almost like I was interviewing a completely different person. He wasn't particularly happy with what was going on around Photograph Smile. Whoever was handling him, he was there with somebody else who did seem to have be a little heavy-handed handling uh, Julian. And it just made sense because he didn't say directly but he didn't make it sound like the release and the aftermath of photograph smile was a particularly pleasant experience for him and i thought to myself that may explain why it just it didn't click i didn't click with him i didn't feel he was a very warm individual and his performance was actually singing over a pre-recorded track from the album hmm. that was what he did in the studio which ended up sounding like i was just playing the uh, the cd yeah yeah i haven't run into that but you know i mean people have bad days you know and and i guess you ran into one with julian I yeah can't, i really can't think of any times that's happened with a, a beatles world interviewee you know, Yoko, I found very pleasant, too. I've interviewed Yoko a bunch of times, and um, the first time was about the Lost Lennon Tape series, which was about to start. And, um, and you know, she was charming. I mean, you sort of go into the interview sort of realizing, you know, what people who work for her have said about her and other people have said about her and all that stuff. And you know that, you know, if you're turning up to interview someone for the Times, they could be Hitler and they're going to be on their best behavior. It's just the way it is. Most of the time, sometimes they're not. But Yoko was, was very charming. She, she she answered anything I asked uh, at one point. I don't know. There, there, were, there were some things that she did, like, you know, writing down her number if I had later questions and stuff. And then I think she was sort of ripping the number off the piece of paper that she 
wrote it on, which was otherwise blank anyway, and then just said, I don't know why I did that and just started giggling like a, like a, you know, a girl. I thought it was, I thought it was really kind of charming. You know, it, it's not what you think of, of, of Yoko as, as being, you think of her as tough, you know? And one time I interviewed her, the, the first few times I interviewed her were downstairs in studio one, which Dave Morell described last time. It's basically an apartment, but it's where the office is and she has a huge, living room where she does interviewees and has you know art in it and all that stuff and uh one time eventually she wanted to do the interview upstairs in what is her apartment apartment and she said have you you've been up here right and i said no actually i haven't and she said oh well then you'd like to see all this and she led me into the living room and said this is the white piano that john gave me for my birthday and you know oh, put a little man. plaque on it and that's the one where we play imagine and uh you know and all of this stuff she's just showing me and it's like totally wow this is the coolest you know i have the best job in the universe <laughs> uh <-huh>. so <laughs> So you got to see all of the apartment? Uh, probably not all of. I saw that living room. I saw the kitchen. And then I'm not, not sure where we actually did the, the interview. We might have actually done the interview in the kitchen. Huge kitchen. I mean, a, a refrigerator that could feed, you know, India. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was... It was it was great. And, you know, I, I just seeing that piano was enough for me in a way, you know. And, uh, you know, that time wasn't the last time we spoke, but it was like after three or four times and she sort of knew me by then. And and so, you know, some of the time we could just have a chat that wasn't even interview. You know, it was just about John, what was important to John, you know, how John reacted to things, things John cared about and said. And and, it, and at one point, I mean, I thought it was, it was kind of touching, you know, I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm really one of the disappointments of my life is that, um, you know, I was just getting to a point in my career where I could have gotten an assignment to interview him right when he was shot, you know, uh, like it def I definitely could have interviewed him for his next album, certainly, and uh, or anything else, if he did something else that year, that could have happened, but alas. And she said, you know, he was a good man. I think you would have liked him. <laughs> said, well, yeah. <laughs> so. so when, uh, you, when you interviewed Yoko, was it tied to a specific release, a new album or anything? Or um, Well, the first time, was uh about the lost lennon tapes all oh, right right then yeah. um i talked to her about um the 50th anniversary show that she ended up doing in liverpool remember that uh mm -hmm. ringo sent a video of i call your name one time okay that time i was just talking about was when there was that lennon broadway play that she sort of supported or underwrote or whatever the one where you know, John Lennon was played by like eight people of all different colors and genders, you know, in one performance. And, you mm -hmm. know, and that was, you know, that was the idea of that really, you know, talk about John as every man and woman. <laughs> and that play didn't uh, last very long, unfortunately, but um, there was that. And, and then um, probably the last time I talked to her was when she did that exhibition at the, I guess the Rock and Roll Mu Hall of Fame Museum had an outpost in Lower New York for a while. And so we met down there in, you know, basically Soho. And we're walking along the street because we were going, she has, a, she has a property there where it looks like a big garage, but she's got, you know, files and work and people and stuff going on in there so we met there and she showed me a bunch of the material that was going to be on display and then we walked over to the museum and you know she walked through part of it with me and then said so why don't you take it in on your own 
take as much time as you want. And when you're done, I'll be right over here and we'll talk. And she was just showing me like great stuff. Like, you know, she showed me another of his pianos. This was a, this was an upright piano, not a, a baby grand like the white one. And this one, she said, so you see these burn marks? Yeah, John used to put his cigarette on the edge when he was writing a song and it would just burn down, burn the piano, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, wow. there, there were handwritten lyrics and there were, you know, well, there were his bloody glasses were there. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people were very critical of the bloody glasses thing, but she was using it to say, look, something has to be done about gun violence. And here's an example of why, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, okay, she has a point. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of brave of her to have to look at that every time. You know, but she's doing it for a reason and she's doing it for a good reason. So, yeah, a, a lot of what she does is misinterpreted, you know, yeah. as though she's looking for sympathy. Yeah. But she's actually making a statement when she does it, like putting the glasses on the, the season of glass album cover. Yeah. The no, I really respect glass. Yoko. I mean, um, also, you know, when we're walking from her garage like thing, I don't even know what to call it, to the museum. You know, she's, she's still do, doing the tour guide thing. She's saying, okay, so if you look down the street, right, that, right, that, see that building over there? That was where John and I had the Newtopian embassy. <laughs> huh. And the Newtopian embassy is like, that's pretty specialized, right? You know, <laughs> so, um, so let's see, who else, who else do you uh, want yeah. to know about? Um, well, just tell me one more thing about Neil Aspinall. Was everything kind of, really just business-like to tell you more about the anthology? Or did you feel as though you got to know him as a person? Was he very guarded about talking about the Beatles with you? Well, I think he's just a guarded person. Um, in this conversation, uh, I didn't feel that he was, you know, refusing to answer or not answering adequately anything that I asked him. But of course, I was asking about this project specifically. You know, and he, he had a, a, a kind of um, a subtle sense of humor. In fact, at, at the very beginning of the interview, he said, yeah, yeah, if, if I have a problem, I'll, I'll just take the fifth. And I said, I, I'm not sure if you can take the fifth. You're British. <laughs> I think only Americans can take the fifth. The fifth doesn't apply to you. And he said, well, I found that any time you say to an American reporter that you're taking the fifth, they know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he didn't take the fifth, you know, and Neil actually, Neil actually would have had a reason to be a little standoffish because by then, you know, I'd written a lot of articles in the times that weren't based on interviews that were based on something they put out. And I virtually always would say, but you know, they should have done this instead. So you know, when they were doing the love show, which it turned out that, you know, Giles Martin came to New York and played me the soundtrack at a studio in surround. And I really liked what he did. So I felt a little bit better about the show than I had, but simply as a rhetorical stance, I was taking the view that, wait a minute, they haven't released anything new since the anthology, except for Let It Be Naked, maybe. And the reissues still aren't here of the CDs, and those first CDs really need to be updated. So basically, they're kind of wasting their time doing a, a, a site-specific show in Las Vegas. Just stuff like that, you know, various things they did. I, I don't know, you know, my wife said to me at one point, you know, do you realize that you can't write an article about the Beatles without telling them what they should be doing? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, well you know, I, I'm a critic, right? I mean, that's what we do. <laughs> so Neil would have had a reason to be... Uh, standoffish and he wasn't also because the anthology was right after the BBC first release and I reviewed that in the Times comparing it negatively to the uh, 12 disc or whatever it was Great Dane set and um, and they Apple didn't like that that much in fact they had someone working on anthology and other programs after it named David Saltz and David mm -hmm. Saltz came in and said so are you the one who wrote about, you know, 
saying that Apple is, you know, not been a good conservator of the Beatles legacy and comparing the BBC set negatively to the bootleg. And I said, yes, I was. And I do it again. <laughs> so, but, you know, I guess maybe Neil wanted him to do the, this guy to do that instead of him doing it. But, uh, and then Derek, who, you know, I had spent the week with, we had a great time, uh, and I'd interviewed him before. He said, you know, I, I never saw that article that you, uh, where you were complaining that, you know, we didn't put enough on the BBC set and, you know, we're not the best conservators of the Beatles legacy. Could you send me that? So I sent it to him and then he called up. Uh, I was back in New York by then and he, and, and I said, oh, so, What'd you think? And he said, oh, it was a bunch of nonsense, of course. But anyway, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I love Derek. Derek was the best. You know, I think if anyone out there who listens to us hasn't read any of Derek's books, there are, you know, maybe three or four of them, maybe more, actually. You know, just look one up and get it. His writing style is him. It's as if he's standing there talking to you. He was just like the way he writes. And it's smart and sharp and funny. And he knows an awful lot about it. New, I should say, an awful lot about a lot of things. Before he died, he had told me that he was just getting into opera. And he was telling, and he told me which operas he liked. And, you know, I just said, okay, that's interesting. And, and he didn't die that long after the anthology. I can't remember when it was. But when I heard that he had cancer and not long to live, I, um, I just went and got like 10 or 15 opera sets and wrote an annotated thing about each of them and posted them to Derek, Care of Apple. And I know that it got to Apple. I hope it got to Derek. I know it got to Apple because Apple called to tell me how much the customs duty was. <laughs> so I thought, really? You guys can't pay the customs duty? Okay, fine. So I worked out actually, talking about all-star, uh, you know, Beatles world things. I worked out a deal with Mark Lewison that he would pay the duty because you know he's in britain he has british money it's easy and i would repay him you know with stuff i was sending him anyway i guess i'm not sure what what our deal was but but that was that and um you know i hope derek got those i mean he was too sick to respond so i don't know what he thought but but derek i was a big fan of derek's you know it's to apple's credit that despite the fact that you were critical of them they still invited you back. Yeah. They didn't take out anything on you, which says a lot about them. That's true. That's true. I think they also felt that, you know, I'm critical, but I know the stuff. And I'm making a reasonable point here from a, a collector's point of view. Now, for, if they don't care about collectors, that's fine. Um, you know, we get called the socks and sandal crowd now. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, but you know, I mean, I like Giles, too. He can call socks and sandals all he wants. Um, you know, we had a really good time that day that I, that he brought his hard drive to a recording studio and uh, played me the love stuff. And uh, actually, at that point, I also gave him a CD of, of mashups that other people were making that were far wilder than anything that was done for love because I, I knew he was going to say and of course he did that you know oh, the purists will hate this and I and I said no I'm really sorry but the people who made these that I'm about to give you are also purists and you listen to this and they're way out there much farther than you guys so but we had a good time and uh, you know when I got back to the paper I, I and filed the piece at one point uh, the editor said so um, do you have, is there anything further you can say about listening to these things in the studio? And, you know, and I got to say, listening to them in the studio was much different than listening to the CD on my stereo at home. And I've got pretty good equipment, but not like that. So that at the beginning of, you know, something, you could pretty much hear the pick on the guitar. I mean, that was pristine. 
and maybe something about the compression on CD or whatever, not quite the same, but you know, I'm listening to this stuff and this was just heaven. So my editor said, is there any, anything else you can, you can say about the listening session? And I said, well, it's actually the best time I've had in my life while fully clothed. And she said, I am not putting that in the New York Times. So you heard it here first. <laughs> All right. So that puts a wrap on the show. Those are, you know, precious memories to share with us, mm -hmm. Alan. Thank you. And uh, maybe I, I might suggest that you go back and listen to many of these interviews. And uh, if there are more to tell, we'd certainly like to hear about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, And, um, you know, uh, I'm sure I, I can speak for uh, Darren that um, you transferred these to digital. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, a Dropbox account, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> mm. And thank you for saying all you said about Yoko. I interviewed her twice, and she was really extremely nice. Yeah. She couldn't have been nicer. So I think a lot of people just um, have a very false impression of her. I, I can only tell you that. It was a, a really nice experience when I spoke to her Absolutely. on the phone two times. Yeah. 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 All right. So why don't we go around and give our folks the contact information for us? And we'll start with you, Darren. All righty. Uh, go to Facebook. I've got two Facebook pages. One is Darren DeVivo. The other one uh, has my name in it. But I, I, I keep saying this every week. I've changed the name of the page, and I never remember what it is <laughs> now. It's something to the effect of Darren DeVivo. WFUV DJ, Beatle podcaster, writer. Uh, but either page, click like or send me a friend request and we'll be in touch. Oh, if you want to email me, email me at WFUV. Uh, the address is Darren DeVivo, D A R R E N D E V I V O, at WFUV.org. And you can catch me on WFUV uh, for the time being. 10 p.m. to midnight only, Monday through Thursday nights, due to the uh, the pandemic. We are pretty much uh, all, everyone at WFUV, broadcasting from home still, and for technical reasons, uh, unable to uh, do the normal 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. weeknight show. So it's 10 p.m. to midnight, Saturdays 1 to 4 in the afternoon on WFUV, although not this Saturday. I'm being preempted. Okay. I kind of envy you, Darren, being able to do your show from home. I would love to be able uh, to do it. A... Thank you. Well, I, it is cool in some regards and, and others. I wish sort of I was doing the full four hours on Monday through Thursday nights, not just two a night. But I understand the logi I don't Actually, no, I don't understand the logistics, but I can only imagine the, the uh, technical aspect of how things are running with every single host doing their show from home. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, and even the Saturday afternoon show that I'm doing now, 1 to 4 p.m., that's a time that's been reserved for years for our sports, sports, our sports yeah. program. But our sports department at WFUV uh, is entirely made up of Fordham University students. And, you know, the situation with the pandemic and students and campus and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and being in classrooms or being home. We don't have a sports department present any longer, at least until whatever. So uh, their sports show is now on an indefinite hiatus. And, you know, it's opened up Saturday afternoons for me on the main WFUV. But yeah. um, it is kind of cool being able to do the show from home, except that you end up with all kinds of things like water going through the pipes or the air conditioning turning on and that, you know, ends up getting picked up by the mic in the background. But, uh, just talk louder when that happens to drown out the sound <laughs> of the uh, air conditioning. Mm. Or play albatross. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Alan. All right, Alan, how about you? Probably the easiest way to get me is on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can reach all of us by email at ready. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have two Facebook pages. One is plain old things we said today. 
and I think the preferred one, whatever that means, is things we said today, Beatles radio fans. That's the first place we post the shows. Usually post a link either to Podbeam or YouTube. You can also get them on iTunes. So, and that's that's basically it. Okay. As for me, you can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. I have a Facebook page for Ken Michaels. I just did an interview with Sam Wiles, who hosts a solo Paul McCartney podcast show called Paul or Nothing. (laughs) And we did a show on the Flowers and the Dirt album. And that show is now up on Podbean, podbean podbean.com. Type in the name of the show, Paul or Nothing, and it's the most recent show there. Okay, I had a lot of fun talking with Sam. Sam comes from England young uh big uh beetle fan discovering paul's music and uh nice to hear you know a different point of view from you know the younger generation and how they experience paul mccartney's solo music also um we just did a show on talk more talk on john's mind games album which you can now find on a whole b- bunch of places on youtube on uh, our facebook page talk more talk a solo beatles video cast also on iTunes, on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, pretty much everywhere. Um, I did uh, an interview with Dave Morell as we did here on the show, in our last show. You can hear that interview on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And every week on the website, I do have Beatles trivia, where you can win one of now 10 prizes, including the brand new Blu-ray for an accidental studio, which is all about George Harrison's handmade films. Also, the new ebook of Eight Arms to Hold You from Chip Manninger and Mark Easter, and the new uh, DVD or Blu ray of That'll Be the Day, the 1973 movie with uh, David Essex and Ringo. And um, that's all on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. And uh, don't forget to listen to my syndicated show, Every Little Thing. There's a page for that on my website that lists all the radio stations that cover it and when it airs with links to their websites. So you can stream them, and also if, uh, if it's on other platforms, like TuneIn, for example. Um, and that uh, pretty much puts the show to a close. This is a lot of fun talking to you, Alan, about uh, your remembrances, about all these special people in the Beatle world. And maybe we'll do another one. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to go, you know, a little more in depth on the interviews with Paul. There might be some things you forgot about. <laughs> That he said with Paul, with Paul or Ringo or George Martin, but maybe we'll do that again sometime in the future. Okay. So for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. And for things we said today, we'll see you next time. Yeah.